I am just so pleased to be here with you tonight and um, just want to tell you that part of the reason why I do what I do is because I constantly learn from people like you. And so I am just, um, I have a, a great honor to actually lead the Cancer Survivorship Program at Stanford. And it really, my passion uh, comes from the people that I've worked with over the last 25 years. And fortunately, there are some people that I have worked with for that long. And so what I've learned is that the gift of life comes at a price and that um, even when the cancer goes away, sometimes there are effects that people have to live with. And um, tonight we're going to talk about fatigue. Um, Holly has actually been quite the forerunner in terms of what... Um, cancer survivors need or want, and that is with not only this lecture series that um, has topics that I will mention tonight, and you can always go back and look at those videos, um, but also with all of her programming, and she not only has developed this program, but directs it, and so together we have partnered on this talk because Holly actually knows quite a bit about fatigue management and actually has a handout for you, so that when um, questions come, I hope you'll ask them of both of us, or we may partner in terms of um, answering them for you. So I, you've already heard me say a word, and I actually have already seen a physical reaction from some of you. So um, I just want to start with cancer survivor, that term. It's one that, that, I, uh, that I really like. Not everybody does. Um, I want you to know that when I refer to it tonight, I am going by these definitions. So this is a definition that is used by our government um, and many other organizations saying that uh, someone is considered a survivor from the day of diagnosis to the last day of life. But what I will do tonight, to be as clear as I can, is that when I talk about different types, styles of management, I'll talk about whether it's during treatment or after treatment. <coughs> Is that all right? OK. So energy. Energy is finite. There's only so much of it in the world, and there's only so much of it in our bodies. And to just talk about energy changes first, we all have changes in our energy. And the most common example is when we get a cold or a flu. Uh, the, our, ex our bodies do not have the energy to do all the daily activities. And I'd say that we expect that. Do we expect that the energy will shift and where we apply ourselves is different? No. So um, for many people, energy uh, shifts when they have to heal from an infection or from an inflammatory state or from surgery. Fatigue is different than that. Fatigue is a persistent tiredness or exhaustion following cancer and treatment. This is a, uh, often something that's concerning to people because it's often something that's felt when the cancer is diagnosed. This is not, fatigue after treatment is not necessarily a sign of cancer recurrence. It's often a sign of healing. So it is not necessarily a sign of cancer recurrence. But it is persistent. This is the 1979 gas line. Do any of you remember that? No gas today went on for many, many months. This is called a word cloud. So this is something that shows up on the internet more and more. And it's often a basically a summary or response to a question that's posed online. And what this word cloud does is it takes a word like fatigue, and then based on people's responses and the number, the frequency of them, it's kind of mushed together, and the font size is telling of what the response number is. And I show this to you for two reasons. One is that it looks like a word cloud. People often describe fatigue as living in a cloud. Um, and second is a reminder that uh, people get fatigued for reasons other than cancer. Tonight, we're going to focus only on the fatigue that is relative to cancer and its treatment. More simply put, it sometimes feels like you're running out of juice and just can't recharge. So as we tease out these factors for cancer-related fatigue, different than other types of cancers, we're going to, I'm hoping we'll develop some strategies to manage it 
and then talk about how to get support. Because we're filming tonight and out in um, internet land, um, the filmers are asking that we hold questions to the end. So causes. So the, like the pathophysiology, the biochemical reason for fatigue is still not understood. So what you're looking at are the common sense approaches, the things that many of you probably know. Um, on the left-hand column, that's the list of things that, as healthcare providers, we first jump to and think about. And there are things for you to think about as well and partner with your healthcare team. So one is medications. Even though every medication a person takes is meant to do good, they all have side effects. And one that's somewhat common is it can make people feel tired. Second is infection. When the energy changes very quickly and people are just feeling down, um, that often is a trigger to say, is what's going on? What's changed and is there an infection? And again, the common example is the flu or the cold and you've all had that experience many times in your life. Another term that comes up quite a bit with fatigue is anemia. Anemia is when the red blood cell count and the circulation, the circulating blood is low. That got a lot of attention about seven years ago because there was a medication made to help boost the red blood cells. And we all got excited that we could actually help people feel more energetic by boosting their red blood cell count. And that, that it helps in some situations, but it certainly doesn't uh, answer all of the fatigue issues. Another is hormones, and this is one that does not get talked about very often. By hormones, I mean the thyroid, which sits here around the front of our neck, and that actually uh, produces a substance that helps give, gives us energy, among other things. Also is the sex hormone. So in men, um, if, if a man is not producing enough testosterone over a long period of time, some of the feelings that that man may have is fatigue. The same is true for women, that sometimes in the way they go through menopause, in a transient way, they may have a period of low energy. So that's something we think about when people come in and say, wow, I just feel wiped out and I can't explain why. And then, particularly in the after-treatment setting, um, is, how, is looking at how the vital organs work. So we're thinking about the heart, is the heart pumping efficiently and getting the blood circulated that has the oxygen carrying red blood cells in it and getting it to the tissues so people can move the way they need to and breathe the way they need to? Are their lungs operating efficiently so that the oxygen gets pulled in from the air and then passed to the heart to the bloodstream? And then other things like the kidneys and the liver. So these are, the organ function is very easy for us to check in some ways, and that's the routine blood tests that get done so very often. Um, and then if it's something specific about the heart, then it often requires another type of test, like an echocardiogram. On the right is the pie, and these are factors that are things that we as healthcare providers want to get better at addressing, and they're things that uh, you feel and we don't often see. Um, and they are ones that often people who are cancer survivors are dealing with themselves and hopefully with the support of their healthcare team. They also are interrelated, which is why I have them listed uh, in the pie shape. And so starting with a common example that we can all relate to is sleep. When our sleep is disturbed, many of us don't feel well. I'll tell you by the third night for me, I'm done. And I'm cranky, so my mood has changed. My desire for activity is zero. I would like someone to bring me food. And, um, and that starts a cycle. And if asked to rate energy, often people in those situations will say their energy is very low. So then if we put that into a kind of a chronic or long-term situation where people are fatigued, that ends up being sometimes a vicious cycle. And the one component that contributes greatly to that is pain. And so to talk about pain, Pain medicines are still not what we want them to be, but pain is still something to address, partnering with your healthcare team to do the best that we can to make you as comfortable as possible. Because with pain, it's very difficult to exercise. And without exercise, we lose our muscle tone and lose our reserves in our heart and lung. And then it's harder to just do daily activity.
So they are very intertwined. And there's one comment I'd like to make about pain and mood. We all know that we don't like pain and we don't feel good when we have pain, but we really have learned that if someone has pain for a long period of time and is getting depressed as a result of it, that the best way to handle the pain is to address both issues at the same time. So that may mean uh, antidepressant and pain medicine. It may mean uh, some medicines and some other approaches like mindful uh, mind-body-based activities, which we'll talk about later. Um, but they really are important to address together. The point of nutrition is a little bit tricky because nutrition is, of course, vital to our being, and it's so culturally ingrained in our day, and it's so important to us as caregivers to be sure that the person we're caring for is fed well. We haven't been able to tie a lot of evidence to pain and fatigue. Um, we know that good basic nutrition is important, but we don't know that if someone goes without fruits and vegetables for a month, if they really are going to be any worse off in terms of energy than if they ate those fruits and vegetables. So we know it's part of the circle. We know it's part of healthy living, um, but it's also something to be uh, mindful that if eating is off for a while for all the for many reasons that people can still actually regain their energy in other ways with things like exercise. So the slides that you see tonight are all evidence-based, uh, meaning that they came from one of or more of these organizations. These are three professional organizations who feel it's their responsibility to gather evidence uh, so that we as healthcare providers and you as uh, cancer survivors, and I mean that including caregivers, um, can live the best life possible. One is ASCO, the American Society of Clinical Oncologists, and most of the physicians that you have seen belong to this organization. Um, the second is the Oncology Nursing Society, and most of the nurses you may have seen, I hope, belong to this organization. And third is the NCCN. This is a national organization in the US. However, the guidelines are used across the world. And this is a collaboration of many medical centers, including Stanford. Uh, and they get together, the experts in the field, and they work on guidelines to help us and to help you. And they have by far the most, collected the most evidence regarding the best way to handle fatigue. So when you see on the slides NCCN, it means it came from those guidelines. And can you all hear me? Okay. So I'm gonna step back for a moment and go back to the blue circle and tease out the factors. And one is sleep. So I mentioned it. Easier said than done. Every person who's been through cancer treatment has told me that their sleep is not the same for a long period of time. And so often, we will uh, offer medications, at least in the short term, which may help the closed eyes part, but we know that those medicines do not help uh, a person have a totally normal sleep cycle, meaning that they may be short on their dream stage or short on another part of their sleep stage. So as that time passes and people want to try uh, again improving their sleep without medications, these are some hints. One is actually to get into bed at a regular time and leave bed at a regular time. You'll hear the theme of habit or routine quite a bit tonight um, because there's a, a quite a bit of security and comfort and um, requires less energy if people have a regular routine. Second is, um, if possible, in Northern California to use the bedroom just for sleep and for sex. Real estate's very expensive here, so we know that's not always possible. Um, but the idea is that the mind is associating uh, the bedroom with a calming time and for sleep. It also helps us disengage from all our screens. So more and more we find that uh, we bring screens into bed with us. Uh, numbers of men, large numbers of people, somewhat based on age, will bring their phones into bed and keep it at their bedside. But that's actually very stimulating to our eyes and then to our brain. So actually letting go of all the electronic screens about 30 minutes before sleep can be very helpful in winding down. 
um, a relaxing bedtime ritual, and again, ritual, habit, routine, some of that is just appealing to your comfort. So many times people who experience pain say that it's worse at the end of the day because they're tired. And so part of what the, uh, part of a good bedtime routine is doing something that's actually comfortable. So examples that people have taught me is low lights, no electronic screens, a bath or a foot soak, or just, or just taking a warm washcloth over the body, just bringing it down, getting into comfortable clothes, good smells, relaxing music. Some people prefer this kind of snow sound. Um, and just reading something that's absolutely relaxing. For people who have a hard time turning their mind off, or they just, they're processing a lot, as, as we often do towards the end of the day, um, one of the key tips is to actually have a pad of paper and a pencil at the bedside and to just write it down. Even if you have it in your computer, even if you have it on a list somewhere else in the house, it's actually telling your body, I have it. It's here, it's safe, and now I'm going to try to let it go. So some simple things like that can help. There's some other strategies that um, can be helpful to people who go to sleep all right, but then they wake up quite a bit. So the concrete suggestions to start with is um, the, the end time of your fluid intake. So it takes approximately two hours from the last time we take a sip of fluid to the time we urinate it out. And so if fluid intake can stop two hours beforehand, there's a better chance of not having to get up to urinate. Now, there's many factors that affect that, but that's just a basic tip. Another one is that when a person wakes up is to, there's different rules, and you may, I see by your eyes that you may have already tried some of these strategies. Um, some is that if, the, if you really wake up is to get out of bed to again leave the bed for rest and to read something that's kind of do a crossword puzzle or something that's really relaxing in another place to you feel your body yawn and come back. Um, if people have that problem over per a period of time, there's something called sleep restriction that can be done. And what that means is that you take actually write down the number of hours that you're actually asleep. So from 11 p.m. to 12.30 p.m., from 2 to 3, and you add it up, and then only allow yourself to be in bed for that period of time. And once that period of time is up, you set the alarm, you get up. And so it's, it's really an investment in time to do this, um, and it takes several days for it to start to work, but sleep restriction can be helpful to some people in that time period. And I can answer questions about other strategies uh, during the question and answer period. You'll see here two other things, hypnotics, that goes back to the medication uh, question. Um, and those medicines are shorter acting now and they have less long uh, kind of side effects, meaning they leave our bodies earlier. And second is a polysomnography, which is basically a sleep study to better understand the sleep pattern so that some uh, changes can be made. Because I wouldn't want you to fall asleep tonight. This is the UN. You want to go back to that? It's Cook Island. Yeah, who is that? Oh. Whoever is representing Cook Island. <laughs> yeah. So healthy diet. Um, this is our new food pyramid. Have you all seen this? Yeah. So you can see that um, the lobby for the dairy dairy farmers is still strong. Um, the idea behind my healthy plate is balance. It's about getting kind of the right amount of fruits and vegetables on the plate. And the one thing that's not here is the hydration piece. So dairy does provide some hydration milk um, and calcium, which is important. But the hydration piece plays an important role in our sense of energy. So again, outside of the cancer-related fatigue, just our daily energy can shift if we are dehydrated. So for a normal adult who's about 130 to 150 pounds, um, it's a, you, we are supposed to drink two liters of hydrating liquid per day. 
So that doesn't mean tea or coffee or colas. So two liters, and even though we may not feel like we urinate that much, we actually lose a lot of it through our sweat and our mouth and our nose. So two liters of hydrating fluid a day can go a long way towards feeling good. And once, um, just recognizing that this healthy diet is something that we all strive for, but also I understand that during treatment that things like nausea and just stomach upset for multiple reasons or even lower gastrointestinal upset can really throw this off balance. Um, and that again, this is something to strive for when the digestion is working well. And when it is working well, or even actually when you need some tips for other reasons, this is a wonderful website. It's one that uh, our cancer, um, our cancer certified dietitians uh, subscribe to and ask us to refer to. This is the American Institute for Cancer Research. It's ACOR. They, and one of the fun things that they do is if you ask them any question on their website, they ask for your email address. And then once a week, you get a recipe from them, like it or not. <laughs> but the recipes are wonderful. They're actually really good. They give the whole nutritional uh, breakdown before they give the recipe. And um, they are always coming up with new ideas. So if you have a specific question about nutrition, this is a great place um, to go to online. If you uh, would like some counseling, some education, I highly recommend uh, a cancer certified dietitian. And we have several in Stanford Cancer Center that Holly and I can hook you up with. So exercise. There's three things that are important about this picture. Friends, smiles, and outside. So we know that at the 20th minute of exercise is right about the time that the feel-good substance in our body called endorphins fire or release. And that's what makes us feel good. And there's two things that regular exercisers say um, help them do it every day. One is a routine, putting, literally putting it on their calendar. And two is it makes them feel good. It's not because it's good for them, it's because it makes them feel good. And the ways that um, it can make someone feel good is not only the feel-good substances, but the friends. It's about walking with friends and having a buddy and making that commitment and getting it on the calendar. Now you may wonder, why am I bringing this up in the middle of a fatigue management lecture? Because it's probably it's so counterintuitive. It's the word Holly and I use all the time. But it is one thing under your control that can increase your energy. It is the one thing under your control that can increase your energy. And we now have a multitude of studies that um, show us that it is safe to exercise before, during, and after cancer treatment. And in fact, to the point that there's actually a new term called prehab, meaning if you are thinking about getting treatment um, for cancer, if you're getting, going to get treatment for cancer, you actually start exercising or even get a physical therapy consult before you start the treatment. So we, we scientifically we know that it's good for us. The question is how to do it. And um, I'm going to give you some recommendations, and then we'll go back to how to do it. So this is the 355 rule. This is kind of a nice way to sum up the exercise and the nutrition. One is to eat three squares a day, drink your fluid, and if, you, if three meals a day doesn't work for you and smaller meals, more frequent meals work, that's wonderful. That work, that's great. Try to get five fruits and vegetables in. And with exercise, it is a goal of moving around moderately, so enough that you can kind of feel the uh, change in your breath, still be able to talk, five times a week. That's the recommendation that comes from the American Heart Association, the NCCN, the American College of Surgeons. So these are all people that are looking at the uh, question from different angles in someone's body. So it takes time to work up to that. And I will show you some uh, ways to, to exercise and to do that. 
So with the idea is that you're getting 150 minutes of exercise per day. And that can include gardening, taking out the garbage cans, um, just moving around the house. Getting out and walking isn't always easy for people, particularly after cancer treatment. Um, and so this is a photo of a man in a wheelchair to remind us that there's other ways to have an endorphin release and to get some exercise. We actually know that looking at a horizon for an extended period of time can release the endorphins as well. So in this picture is meant to show that a man doing deep meditative breathing and looking at the horizon can get that effect. And then there's other things. Oops, I'm going to go back to this picture. If you see the man that's on the elliptical trainer here on the right, um, this is a machine that can work really well for people if they have peripheral neuropathy um, because they, this is easier than running or walking outside. There's a, the arm holders to uh, gain some balance. And then in a gym, being on a spin bike or a bicycle can work better than somebody being on a bicycle on the road or on the sidewalk. Then if someone has an ostomy, um, most exercises are okay. Um, swimming is sometimes a little bit tricky, um, but the, the kind of precaution there is to not do things that cause a lot of abdominal uh, exertion. So that means um, no wrestling and to be uh, careful about the way uh, sit-ups are done. So if someone's got lymphedema, then often um, the health, you want to talk with your healthcare team about a compression um, device. And if you're going to start resistive exercise, we want to recommend some strength training, is to work with an exercise specialist. And you may wonder, how do you do that? And um, Holly, under the Cancer Supportive Care Program, has Jane Clark come, and Jane has a couple partners from Sunflower Wellness, and she comes to the Cancer Center every Tuesday, and she offers one-on-one -on -one exercise consultations. So she is the person that can work with each uh, person's specific situation, even if it's low platelet count or um, a change in a device or an amputation, and create an exercise program that will work for that particular person. And she's wonderful at offering follow-ups as well. Then within the Cancer Supportive Care Program, there's just a, uh, just a number of exercise programs. Some of them are listed here for you. Then separate from that, Joyce Hanna actually has a wonderful program called Living Strong, Living Well. This is a partnership with the YMCA's on the peninsula and Stanford. And this is kind of like a cancer, re excuse me, like a cardiac rehab class. So it is run on a 10 week session. People meet twice weekly. The instructors, the, excuse me, the instructors are um, trained in knowing what to look for and how to help people accommodate. And it's meant to just help people get moving again. So it's a combination of a ro simple aerobic exercise, um, weight lifting, and stretching. And one of the things um, the people I work with like most about this program is that every participant has had the cancer experience and they're there together and they don't have to talk about it. They're just there moving forward together. So this is for specifically for people after treatment. And then for uh, the East Bay in particular, the cancer support community has very similar uh, offerings. All of these are free. So combining the exercise with uh, more the mind-body connection, uh, yoga is often thought of as exercise, but it also, in part with the style of breathing, um, helps with the mind-body connection. I've had the great privilege of, um, as I mentioned, working with people who are 20 years from cancer and some interviewing some that are 40. And when I ask them, what is the one thing that helped you most? they say it was mindful meditation. And that takes many forms for many people. It can be prayer. It can be uh, walking a labyrinth. It can be truly just mindful, uh, the discipline of mindful meditation. It can be guided imagery. But they say that that is the one thing that, get, that was the most helpful, that stuck with them for that number of years. Acupuncture has actually been shown uh, to be helpful in fatigue. So it is something to think about. 
if it's uh, the approach that you're interested in, and more and more health insurance plans will cover at least some sessions. Then there's touch therapy, and what I mean by that is things like where people touch the person, that the cancer survivor, so massage, Reiki, which um, we'd like to tell you more about during the Q&A session, and then healing touch. All of them are meant to be restorative without the person having to exert him or herself. And then cognitive behavioral therapy um, has been shown to be effective after treatment. In a lot of ways, this is, um, uh, we've touched on that with all the different uh, routine suggestions I've made, and we'll talk a little bit more about some common sense suggestions in a few minutes. So you notice that none of these slides have had, really had medications on it, and it's because there aren't really many, there is no magic pill. So um, there aren't many medications that can be, that we have yet to find to be helpful in relieving fatigue. So when people are in treatment and have relatively widespread cancer, studies have shown that these two drugs um, can have some benefit. When studied after treatment, they've shown very little benefit. So these are two medications, again, we can talk about. They're meant to be stimulants um, to help kind of pep people up. And then supplements is a very frequent question. It's something that I think we all think about going back to the nutrition uh, factor, which is if we put, uh, we are what we eat, and if we put good things in our body, will we feel better? And so ginseng and vitamin D have specifically been studied, and there just hasn't, uh, the studies have not shown evidence that they positively affect energy. So it keeps coming back to balance. And these are the common, some of the common sense uh, ways to conserve energy. And I've got a laundry list to go with each one of these um, P's. But I thought that since um, all of you probably have a trick or two, I wanted to know from the videographers if I could ask the audience to um, perhaps give some suggestions. So I can throw out some, but I'd like to actually hear some from you as well. Is that okay? Yeah? And I'll repeat whatever you say. So does anybody have any tricks that they have learned so far that they want to share? Yes? I don't know, but laying down with my feet raised, So 20 minutes of laying down with their feet raised as a rest as a rest. Not, I'm not mm -hmm. As a rest. And that goes to the point two of, you know, rest when you need to, and then uh, get up, and then do something and rest again. And that's different than napping. So if sleep cycles are an issue, then um, we suggest that you keep the naps to a minimum. Um, but resting is wonderful. Yes? So I find out, even though not lately, that walking between 30 minutes to 45 minutes will help me. So walking 30 to 45 minutes helps you. You get the gold star. <laughs> you said it, exercise. <laughs> so, um, and I just, I don't know, how are we on time? So actually, do you mind tell, I, if I tell you a side story? So um, there's this, my favorite, favorite study ever uh, was for uh, actually workers. And at 3 o'clock to 4 o'clock when people feel a lull and they just, you know, want to go grab the coffee or the chocolate, they actually did a study. So one group uh, drank coffee, one group ate chocolate, one group went for a walk for 20 minutes, and one group took a nap. And then they measured their you know, self-reported energy over time. It's the ones that took the walk that had sustained energy through the rest of the day. So that, that converted me most of the time. Any other um, tips someone wants to share on this list? That's a great suggestion. So the suggestion is to just add a few more minutes every day, build up, and that's 
absolutely correct. And that, that speaks to the, um, the pacing part, the pacing part. I'm going to throw out a couple that um, are written up here. And it, some of them are easier said than done, like to delegate as much as possible. Um, one thing that keeps coming up in the planning and the organizing is just about kind of spending some time organizing activities so that they, you know, errands or things in the house. And some really practical tips that I thought are helpful is actually even just wearing an apron or a tool belt and having uh, what you need like actually right with you. So uh, an example would be, let's say you want to tend to your potted plants, but you're just going back and forth into the garage. Well, just put everything on a belt and just have it with you or just keep it in a belt and just tie it on. So some of those, uh, that strategy has worked for some. Um, stop and get rest when you need to. Um, sit to do things whenever possible. Um, and avoid having lifting uh, when possible. Another tip was to use a cart or a wagon to move things from room to room or place to place. Um, wearing a fanny pack. And then probably most important under prioritizing is to focus on things that you enjoy and to, of course, be realistic about what you can get done. And the um, line of when you're too tired to eat, I was really excited to see what the NCCN came up with there. OK, this is what it says. Let others help you prepare food. <laughs> but the important part of that is friends and family uh, usually do like to help. So um, it's, letting, it's letting them know that, that you'll take the help. In meal preparation, I think you probably have thought of all of them, which is like the mi using mixes and prepackaged foods when possible. Um, one tip that actually my daughters taught me, which is to line the um, cookie sheets with aluminum foil. So then you don't have to clean so much. You can just wrap it all up and throw it away. And they definitely teach me every day that they like to let the dishes air dry or you, instead of um, drying and putting them away. And the childcare, uh, one trick, and actually it, it works with uh, work and leisure too, is that in planning those activities, which are really important and fun, is to be thinking about where to sit and how to rest during them, how you can be part of things but still be in a restful position. So with basic activities, um, so that's my life on the left. Um, there's a couple of interesting ones. Has anyone ever tried wearing a terry cloth robe after they get out of the bath or shower so they don't have to expend the energy to dry off? No. You tried that? No. So that, that's one. Um, to keep things organized and within reach. So same idea, like you know, have buckets or just kind of things clustered together so not having to walk back and forth across a room very much. To use a chair in the shower or tub um, how about, have any of you tried using liquid soap or soap on a rope instead of a bar of soap? You do that. Um, and long-handled brushes or combs so that you don't have to keep your arms overhead so much when you're doing your hair. So a long-handled comb is one suggestion. And then with dressing, it's the uh, things that um, very common sense of slipping on shoes, using Velcro closures, nice, comfortable, loose clothes. How about a shoehorn? Does anyone ever use a long-handled shoehorn to get their shoes on? It's kind of a, my grandpa used to do that. It's kind of an old-fashioned strategy. And for women to actually put the bra on with the clips in the front, so you don't have to stretch so much and then turn it around. Wear clothes a button in the front rather than the back. Just watch the back, zip, the back uh, zippers. Um, for housework, hire, hire help. That's always that's the top suggestion. <laughs> but other ones are, um, you know, just use make use of the washer and dryer and long handle again long handled um, dust pans and uh, long handled dusters and mops. So um, just looking at the materials, your tools, to see if they're doing what you need them to do without spending so much energy. And then with shopping, so much of it comes back to, again, being organized. And I'll tell you a trick that I, um, several of us use, and that is, especially if you're an, a phone user or if you like to have your list on paper, is to just keep your standard shopping list with you. So just have the standard inventory. 
of you know X amount of milk, X amount of coffee, X amount of fruit, and then um, if you don't have a list or you haven't don't have the energy to think of a list, you always just have your stock list, the stock list, and that way you know you have your basics at home where you're going to get your basics, and the rest you can get another time. Having snacks readily available. And um, one, if it's really a very, very tiring time, an exhausting time, is to put some favorite foods and beverages in a cooler with ice next to where you're resting. So you just have your nutrition there that you can get when you need it. And then on days you feel well is to cook extra food and just freeze it in small containers. And then if that's not working, um, and uh, friends and family aren't bringing food in, is that there really are organizations. There are organizations that um, will bring food in, and so our social workers or health, the rest of the healthcare team can help with that. And I'm thinking of uh, organizations like Meals on Wheels. So to start to summarize that, um, so kind of wrapping it all together, what are the top take home points? It's to set priorities. It's to make every day matter. It's at the beginning, I hope at the end of every day, you can look back and say that there was one good thing that happened in that day that made that day matter. And then looking ahead to the next day, what is gonna be the priority? What is the one thing that's gonna make that day matter? And plan that in your peak time of energy. Plan that when you've got the energy to do it and pace yourself along the way uh, with rest when you need to and try to not be the lady with five things coming out of six arms. Try one activity at a time. Routine goes a long way towards giving us comfort, security, and reducing the amount of energy we expend. And then fun and games. So it's interesting. Um, fun distraction seems to help people feel less fatigue. And we, we, again, we can't tell you exactly why, but we can tell you that laughing helps, um, that just doing something that you find pleasurable helps, socializing helps. And so that's one key piece to have in your daily routine. Um, exercise, I talked about, delegate whenever you can. Um, and then the idea of postponing non-essential activities, which can be really tricky when you're feeling tired for a long period of time. So one uh, way someone I worked with handled it is he just decided that he was going to handle one big thing a month. So whether it was taxes or whether it was some other big thing. And, and that was it. Everything else was going to have to wait. And that seemed to work well for him. And then the labor-saving devices are some of which are the ones I just mentioned. And then uh, sleep, you know, rest when you can, nap when you don't, don't nap when you don't have to. So what should you expect from your healthcare team? You should expect your healthcare team to ask you about your fatigue and, to, and you should be able to give them a history. So I'll show you a, a little um, way to do that in a moment. Um, because for them, they can't see it. They can see how you're sitting in a chair um, or how your kind of emotion or your mood is but not really what you're feeling. And so being able to say, hey, you know, I haven't been able to take a shower for three days. That's, that's telling us something. I can't carry the groceries up the stairs anymore. Those times of, that type of information is really helpful. And it's something that, at least in my experience, has been very lacking in conversations. And sometimes people don't want to say when they feel tired because they're again worried that it may be a bad sign. Um, but knowing what your activity is, knowing what your uh, energy level is, um, can help us partner with you. And one of the things is, that we need to do, it's our job, is to think, is there a concern for the, about the cancer? It's our job to worry about, to think about that, and, and then to say, no, you know, we really, here's what you've had done, we really don't think that's the issue. Let's look at some other issues. And then we assess for other contributing factors. So. Is it things like infection? Um, that's one of the things I think about. Um, is it things like the hormones? So perhaps we haven't checked the hormone function. You know, they've had this or that treatment and we, we need to go check on that. Is, are the electrolytes okay? Are the kidneys working okay? Medications I touched on earlier, nutritional issues. 
And this word deconditioning, this is a word we use in the um, in healthcare world that doesn't get used very often anywhere else. And that comes back to muscle strength. So when people are on steroids, particularly for a long period of time, no matter what they're doing to try to keep themselves uh, fit, is that those types of medications actually really reduce the strength of our, what we call our flexor muscles, so our biceps and our quadriceps. So one thing I look for is if someone needs help, they have to push themselves out of the chair because their thigh muscles aren't working, that's something for me to assess and to address. And then alcohol um, use. So um, a drink a day is fine, but if people are drinking more than that, or very petite um, and drinking that much, um, it can actually inhibit energy. It can actually reduce energy. So that's one of the things the healthcare team would be asking you about. And then what we need to do is give you some education, like t the information you're getting tonight, and work together on a plan that we, you would be willing and welcoming to try. The other part is to think about other healthcare professionals that can be helpful. And in this way is physical therapists, occupational therapists, so their specialty is all those adaptive devices. Um, speech and swallowing therapists to help with from the nutritional end and to be able to just be able to deal with dry mouth. Um, cancer certified exercise specialists. Who am I missing? Psychologists, social workers. There's a nutritionist. There are cancer certified dietitians. Goes on and on. So. Here is, now this is, this is a shameless plug for Cancer Survivorship Clinic. So this is for after treatment. This is something I'm very passionate about. This is a form that every person fills out at the start of the, or before the visit. And the first thing we ask is about fatigue. Um, it's a zero to five scale, zero being I don't have it, and five being the most severe. This is just an example of what is, of a way that you can shape it, your history for your healthcare team. You could say, you know, of zero being my best energy or how I felt before I had cancer, and five being so much I can't get out of bed, I'm a three today. That's a nice way to take something you're feeling and make it objective for your healthcare team. And studies actually have shown um, that this idea of a, what we call a Likert scale has been the most reliable in terms of being able to communicate the information. And this is, these are um, calendars that I pulled off the web. Um, and they're not anything specific. Uh, they're just a kind of seven day a week uh, hourly uh, grid that you can use for many different things. And we're happy to send this out to you if you are interested in this. So if you work on paper, you can use something like this to monitor your energy so you figure out when your peak is. If it's not obvious, you can use this to pace yourself to say, gosh, you know, I've got a whole bunch of meds at eight, and I got to deal with <laughs> breakfast, and then blah, 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 and now I need a rest. And you can actually build in a routine that way. You could also use it as a way to um, communicate with others. If you like using um, phones, there are calendar apps. There's a picture of one here that's not anything special, um, but you can just use your calendar on your computer and then you can look at it over time. Because one of the most important, uh, probably the last and most important message I hope you'll take home with you tonight is that this won't last forever. That our minds heal faster than our bodies do. And that one of the very, very important things to do is to look down the ladder, is to think about how you're feeling now and then look back and see how far you've come. Because um, often people will say they get really, really, uh, they heal quite a bit after the therapy is over, but then that last 10, 20% takes so long to regain. So always look down the ladder and see where you've come from and pat yourself on the back. So in terms of programming, um, the Cancer Supportive Care Program um, I mentioned has all kinds of opportunities, the support groups, the exercise classes, the exercise specialists, the mind-body um, activities. Um, oh, not nutrition, let's see, I'm missing one other big one. 
the workshops and this lecture series. And so it's actually an app. And um, Holly has this in print form as well. So it's just a reminder that if you are planning your day and you say, I just want to know what there's available for me today, or I'm coming to Stanford Cancer Center today, what is available to me? You can just, um, if you have this loaded on your phone, you can just put your finger on the date and every, the whole calendar will pop up. And we're happy to help you with that. So I want to give you, a, as we get towards the end, I want to give you a um, new term, and that's cancer rehabilitation. And I think you may hear more about this over time. Um, and it's not that any of the services that you see listed here are new. It's just that they're more and more becoming clustered together. And again, it comes down to following a model of cardiac rehab. And it also comes down to the thought that we as a healthcare team need to be wider and supportive and helping people get back to normal. That there's periods of time during treatment where things are, where certain help is necessary, like swallowing um, exercises or um, physical therapy. But even after treatment, there's this whole piece about how do you get back to normal and who can help with that. So you see, has anyone heard of recreation, recreational therapy? You can just raise your hand if you have one or two. So I always thought of it as being like in a nursing home, uh, as recreational therapy. But like the B VA in the Palo Alto, they, that's actually a very important piece of their rehabilitation services. So it's, it's being able to adapt to get back to the activities you know and love, or how to start new ones that actually achieve some other goals in a way that's very pleasurable. Um, for those who, who, who do smoke, um, there's often smoking sensation um, counseling or classes, and then of course uh, pain management. And then to remember that so much of what um, is felt um, can be supported through groups and through knowing someone that's been there that um, has walked the same journey and can be a buddy. And there's many ways to get that type of support. And again, we can talk about that in a few minutes. So I hope you learned some tips and tools to manage fatigue so that you can re-energize yourself um, or at least preserve the energy that you have um, in natural ways and that you um, know how to become more energetic and more focused and that you know it's going to get better. And with that, I would love to have a discussion and hear your questions and hear your advice. So the question is about sleeping, that uh, often can sleep, could fall right asleep, but now having difficulties getting to sleep. Are you physically tired when you go to bed? So some of the things, when there's a change like that, the kind of first things to think about are, is the body physically tired? Has, it, has that changed? Two, is there something on the mind that isn't, the mind's not letting go of? And is there a way to quiet that down? Three is, has there been a change of medication um, that is a stimulating medication? Um, those are the, the top three to think about. Other questions? Other Words of advice. Um, yes. Oh, sorry. I'll turn that. Yeah. And two days ago, I got that announcement uh, through email, and I was waiting for this topic. And <gasps> she was waiting for this topic. Yes. Four years ago, my breast cancer was found, and surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation. At that time, no problem, just a dump. But one year ago, I find out recurrent uh, cancer and then start treatment again, and her uh, radiation and her uh, chemotherapy for one year. And I really experienced fatigue is terrible. I don't like pain, but fatigue is same as pain, because uh, when I was healthier, and oh, I, I, I'm tired to go to bed, right? Yes. But now I'm tired. That's why I could not sleep, right? 
and I tried many things, yes. and now a doctor that woke up some cells. And also you said, mind is more healing than body. And uh, I'm going to write it down, some hint from you, and I did, I tried something, and I want to share, I park her a little bit far away and walk. And walk here. Yeah. I'm far away going to gym. I oh, walking is so difficult. Mm -hmm. This kind of fatigue. Like step by step. <clears throat> but this muscle is damaged, you mentioned, right? Yes. So I'm so scared of not being able to walk. So I need this lecture to make um, myself tr stronger and get rid of Fatigue. So, so I want to share. Uh, I want to hear all information from other people. What's the hint, right? The hints. Yes. Yeah. So thank you for um, thank you for actually recognizing how important this is. And and again, as as healthcare providers, it's something we. Um, uh, we are. We will continue to get better at addressing, and then to hear your story about how um, you are using your. This is cognitive behavioral therapy where you're telling your mind, I need to do this to get better and I'm going to do it a little bit at a time. Mm -hmm. Yes? I, I wanted to know about alternative therapies. Okay. I understand that that's something that they're you now bringing into the oncology, my oncologist, program, but I haven't seen any results yet. Okay, so is your question, um, so the question of what alternative therapies can be used for fatigue, um, or just I'm in general? I'm trying to figure out how um, I can get in touch with some of the alternatives. Yes, for the fatigue, okay. but and then how do I get in touch with with alternative therapies? So alternative therapy is a word that um, people interpret differently. So um, often. Alternative therapy, people are thinking about, it used to be acupuncture, massage, some of the things that I mentioned tonight, but then also um, approaches that may have come from Chinese medicine or another uh, culture. So the short answer is, if there's anything you saw on the slides tonight that you're interested in, Holly can guide you to those services and they're complementary, with exception of things like acupuncture. If you're thinking of things like um, acupuncture or um, hypnosis or um, some other kind of mix of med biotherapy, thank you, biotherapy, um, actually directly across the hall from where we're sitting is the Stanford Integrative Medicine Clinic and they offer all of those services to anyone. Uh, you don't have to, you know, you can just come to the Stanford um, integrative medicine clinic, that, and that is a fee-based clinic. So you pay money for that or they'll bill your insurance. Does that answer your question? So is there, are you asking about what alternative therapy is, or do you have something well, specifically I, I in mind? Really Actually, Holly, come on up here because they want to get all your great answers. No, it's it's a practice, and Holly is yes. expert at all of this. It's a class that we have. It's um, a national program that was started that was started by a woman diagnosed with breast cancer who happened to be an aerobics instructor, and her husband was also an aerobics instructor, and she really found that after having treatment she became very deconditioned. When she started treatment, she was very muscular, in shape. Um, had no problem with energy, her lifestyle, she was very active. And so she developed this program called NIA, and it is um, movement, it's very spiritual, it's gentle movements, along with aerobics, all done to music. Yeah. Um, we offer that on Wednesdays and Fridays at uh, and fitness center, Vive Fitness on Emerson in Palo Alto, and it's totally free. So you can make it as strenuous or as slow and moving depending upon where you are in your rehabilitation. 
um, all the classes that we provide in the Cancer Supported Care Program, I have done for a number of months mm -hmm. trying to determine is this something that will work within the scope of doing rehabilitation after treatment. Mm -hmm. And um, the first two months that I tried NIA, you know, I'm a real go-getter, so I gave it everything I had and <laughs> moved as fast and hard <laughs> as I could to the music. And I found that it activated and used muscles I had never used before. <laughs> and so then I kind of finished up with a month of really trying to be very gentle with myself, mainly because I hurt. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, really thought, all right, so this maybe is the way to really start in being very slow and movement, almost uh, like you would do in a Tai Chi That's or a Qi Gong. And it's very therapeutic, and it also is very nurturing. In all of our classes, you really develop, a, there are a number of people here that have been in our classes, um, you really develop a camaraderie with people sharing not only the same diagnosis, but a different diagnosis, but the experience. And so it becomes a kind of a tight-knit group. If someone uh, has to leave for a reason, they're missed. Um, and if they come back, they're welcomed. New people are welcomed. And so it's not only those physical, mind, body, spirit, and uh, exercise that can be so nurturing, uh, not only to your emotions, your heart, but also your body. So um, if you look through our calendar, we have a number of things that uh, are considered alternative therapies. Okay, so I'll look. I most certainly do. Okay. I even. Uh, That's why I got confused. About yeah. What it was. Uh, I even include in there our exercise consultation. Yeah. So if you're really not sure what you need to do, um, we have free exercise consultation. Um, Jane Clark and Kim Curry um, do exercise consultations by appointment on Tuesdays, and um, we tailor something for you. They'll make phone calls, making sure that you're following up on those programs. And they um, call on Sundays. You yeah. cannot hide. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so they're there to give you as much support as you want, but you know, it is your, your, your role and your, your engagement that will keep you going forward. But they're very popular. And uh, we also have a wonderful exercise for health class. And so we try to also make our classes in beautiful spots. So our yoga and our exercise is at Samyama Yoga, which is a beautiful yoga studio. It's all glass. Um, we have Verve Fitness on Emerson for our Nia. Um, we have Pilates, which we do in a beautiful Pilates studio in uh, Palo Alto. So we have a variety of things. There's something for everyone to help you recondition. I'm, I'm and sorry. they're free. I'm glad you're addressing all this, but mm -hmm. I don't live here. I live really far away. And so I, I'm finding out, though, mm -hmm. what uh, maybe in some way I can explore. Sure. Well, certainly yeah. yoga. Sure. Because that's taught more, near where mm -hmm. I live. Well, and you might even be able to find some Nia. Healing Touch also is wonderful. Mm -hmm. So with the calendar, if you take that home with you, you well, may I'm be able to find ideas. some of those modalities yeah. so that you can yeah. do it in your yeah. uh, local community. Yeah. Thank you. Super well, are you talking about treatment as far as surgical or chemotherapy, no, radiation? Right I'm in chemo and surgery and then radiation. So. Mm -hmm. um, I would say you should ask your oncologist and your radiation oncologist. Okay. Um, however, research has shown that while you're undergoing treatment, doing these therapies can, um, it's not that it impacts the cancer, but it gives you a better outcome because it decreases stress and anxiety, improves fatigue, improves well-being, those types of things by basically doing that while you're in treatment. Mm -hmm. So, so um, the question is about sleep. Sleep when there is physical and social factors affecting uh, your ability to, to stay asleep. Uh, I can relate, and um, I don't, so the, it, only the advice I have is actually comes back to be more of mom advice, which is really common sense stuff like try to go to sleep when your kids go to sleep, and 
know that you are going to wake up. So it sounds like you already anticipate that. So do you have your tricks to be able to get to get back to sleep um, once you are awakened? Do you have those? I don't have any tricks. No tricks. <laughs> and so that, that gets a little tricky. So especially when you're being woken up from something outside of yourself, um, is getting back to sleep can be really difficult. Um, so the tricks are to either have a, a mantra uh, that you have that you say if you just you know if your body's still resting to kind of keep your eyes closed and say your mantra, um, to, and and that can take many many forms. Um, if you've had to get up and your body is now awake and stimulated, and or, um, is then to actually work on letting your body calming your body down. So that's where just being in a dark, cool room, you know, maybe a light on, maybe you read something that's kind of a personal choice, uh, but no screen time. And, um, and then just until you start to feel like you're about to yawn and then trying to get back to sleep. It's, oh, and um, the, the, if you have something on your mind, that the pad and paper at the bedside can be helpful. Okay, what else? Advice? Questions? Do you all want to spring out of here and go home? Yes? <laughs> Of the slides? Yeah. You know, we'll have um, a, a PDF. Um, the video will be on our website, okay. along with the PDF of the slides. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Kelly has not done a plug for this yet, but our survivorship program, Kelly is manager of our Stanford survivorship program. And if any of you are interested in um, if you're a Stanford patient or an outside patient. Yeah. Yeah. If you're interested in getting a consultation, um, you can take one of these flyers and call Kelly and mm -hmm. she can arrange uh, to meet with you. Um, yeah, and maybe so. Maybe you talk about that a little bit more than just. Yeah, so the, um, so the one thing to know is, and this goes back to the term of cancer survivor, is. Um, Within the clinical world, um, the survivorship clinics are focused on people who are trying to get back to normal after therapy. So um, we've lear we're learning more and more how to just ourselves, how to be more open and provide the service to people who want it. Um, there is just one caveat, and that is that you're done with active treatment. If you're still in hormone therapy, or some type of maintenance therapy, that's fine, but you're done with active treatment, and best guess is that the cancer is, isn't active. Um, then, then we can be um, of help to you because, again, our focus is on helping you get back to normal. Yes? I, I wanted to say as far as sleep is concerned, there's a, a major problem with sleep. Yes. Uh, it's maybe considered going to a sleep clinic, a sleep mm -hmm. medicine doctor. Um, because I had no idea I had severe obstructive sleep apnea, um, which actually for decades I didn't know was actually sleeping and inhaling mm -hmm. oxygen. Uh, it might be good to, for, to find out if you don't know. Yes, excellent point. So the point was to think about a sleep clinic, especially if you're not being woken up by young children, but you actually you know have some control over your evening. And that's the, the fancy term, the polysonography, um, is the sleep clinic and just to, um, to learn about your body. And there's actually an excellent one here at Stanford. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good. I recommend it. And, and we have a recommendation. <laughs> well, thank you very much. We'll be here for a while. You. Appreciate thank your you. uh, staying. Thank you.